Hey everyone, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In this program, we're talking about chimeras. What are they? Are they some kind of mythical creature in scripture? Uh, we'll see. All that and more in this program. Stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a show where we tackle history, theology, and the gifts of the Spirit. My name is Joshua Lewis, and I'm the pastor of King's Fellowship Church in Ada, Oklahoma. Together with my friends, Michael Miller, the pastor of Reclamation Church Denver, and Michael Roundtree, who's heading up Convergence OKC, we set aside time every week to discuss the gifts of the Spirit. We talk about things like how do you pray for the sick? How do you interpret tongues? And should you believe every prophetic word for the new year? You're interested in a charismatic podcast with practitioners who are actually doing the stuff. This is the show for you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on. Today, we are talking about chimeras. Give you a little bit of an expectation of what this show is going to look like. Uh, Man, we're going to walk through the Septuagint, talk about these verses that seem to appear, man, they're more mythical creatures. Uh, We talk about sirens. We talk about satyrs. We talk about leviathans. We talk about dragons and tanines and lilith and centaurs and all these crazy creators uh, that might be in the scriptures. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, So we'll kind of study out some of those. We'll talk about what uh, the Jewish folks and early church fathers, maybe not early church fathers as much as the Jewish context, because they're mentioned in the Jewish scriptures, uh, talking about what they believed these things to be. Uh, And then we're going to discuss, man, what do we think they are? Uh, Are they man, stories that are kind of co-opted by biblical authors uh, so that we can make polemical points against ancient Near Eastern gods? Um, Are they the offspring of Elohim? Or here's a crazy one. Are they some kind of genetic hybrids, uh, genetically altered creatures that, uh, man, that the Elohim were somehow involved in distorting it's a weird theory, but it's out there, and we're going to tackle all that and more in this program. Uh, if you're out there and you're like, hey, I would love to have the show notes for this program, encourage you to check out Patreon. You can find all of that information in our newsletter. Click the link in the description. You'll have all of that cool stuff, and we'll, we'll make all this material available to those who support us over there on Patreon. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to my co-hosts, my partners in crime. I've got Michael Miller and Michael Roundtree with us on the call. Miller, how are you doing over there in the basements of Denver, Colorado? Dude, uh, doing great. Um, just got back from uh, Columbus, Ohio. Got to speak in a classroom at Ohio State and uh, cast a couple critters out of some students and then spoke at a church out there. And this weekend, I'm doing a healing deliverance conference with Roundtree up in Wisconsin. So if Sweet any action. of you are in the Wisconsin area, you should come join us. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, you can find out more on that on uh, my website, thomasministries.org. And then I'll try to do a better job. I'm going to start sending um, Christina, our the one who does our marketing and weekly newsletter, more info about the different events that we've got going on during the year. I'm usually terrible about sending all the uh, things that I'm doing. So I'll see what I'm doing. I'll see if I can do a better job on that. But I'm excited about this because it kind of relates to stuff that I get into. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm a fan of guys that do the uh, Blurry Creatures podcast. And um, I've read Doug Van Dorn's book on giants where he dives into this stuff on chimeras. And, uh, and, you know, I get into all that kind of stuff. So it, it's fun to, to, to goof around in, I'd say. Yeah. Well, it's, it's holiday season, you know, we are kind of uh, talking about ghosties and monsters and critters and all that fun stuff. So it's appropriate to tackle this subject today. Um, at, on the tail end of your announcement about being in Wisconsin, if you're in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, I'll be there. So we'll all be doing conferences this weekend in different locations. Uh, yeah. Round, <laughs> Roundtree, how are you? Uh, well, I guess I, I should probably tell you the name. Of the, Miller, what name of the church are you going to in Wisconsin? Uh, I know you said it's uh, on your website. Gosh, R- I, Roundtree I has it. Remember, uh, Roundtree. What's yeah, the name of the church you're going to? I'm sorry, <laughs> Officer Roundtree. What? Uh, what? <laughs> what guys, church are you going to you, in you uh, in Wisconsin? My beard so much that it it just morphed into a mustache. What can I mm. say? So, yeah. <laughs> Goodness like, gracious, great balls of fire right now. Roundtree. It's not going to last for very long, so y'all don't get used to it. Um, Sounds good. So we're talking about. Uh, Critters, mythical here. creatures, and you're like, how about this mustache? <laughs> so That's a mythical it's in, creature. It's in Clear Lake, Wisconsin. Uh, okay. It's in Clear Lake, Wisconsin. So uh, I can look it up and we can. No, that's a cool. I, I'm going to be at Hope City uh, Church yeah. in Tuscaloosa. So yeah. United Covenant Church for Round there it is. and I. There you go. Cool. That's the name of the church that's putting it on anyway. Let's dive in to our subject matter today. We're talking about chimeras. Uh, I'll be honest, didn't even know this was a thing until I read Doug Van Dorn's book. Have have you guys, did you guys know this was a thing? I mean, if you put, I guess no. if you put Leviathan into the subject of Chimera or like the monsters at the end of Job, I guess I knew that was a bit of a debate on whether those were like real 
like animalistic creatures, whether they were mythology or whether they were demons. Like I knew that was a debate, but I didn't realize that there is some kind of spookier stuff in the book of Isaiah in particular that refers to these entities. Are you, are you guys familiar with this outside of Doug's work? No, uh, I am. Oh, oh well, because... I mean, I, I'm familiar with them in like mythology, but I don't just routinely read the Septuagint. I'm, I'll cross reference with the Septuagint when I'm studying a text, but uh, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Septuagint, it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and uh, the one that was often used in the first century. And so we're going to look quite a bit at the Septuagint today because it mentions these strange creatures that I thought were relegated to uh, mythology. Certainly not the Bible, but they show up in the Bible, and what do we do with that? So. Yeah, uh, I'm interested in this episode. As we talk through it, Josh, I'm with you. When when I looked into this, I was like, what the heck? What what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These, I, these the guys are hand, supposed to be hanging out with Zeus. Like, get, this, get these guys out of my Bible. What, what are we doing here? I know. <laughs> I, I, I totally get into this stuff because I, I remember listening. I used to run during the day and I would listen to hours and hours of Michael Heiser, Naked Bible Podcasts, and he would always quote from the... Uh, what is the dic the dictionary of demons and an ancient mythology? It's like some PDF that you can you can download. But he he would quote from stuff like this in Psalm ninety one about the terror that comes at night or the thing that ravages at midday, and he would say that these were the names of like ancient Canaanite deities. Yeah, I, yeah, so, I've, I've seen that. I've read that before, and, yeah. I, and I've read Heiser's book Demons. It's just been so long. He might have mentioned it. And I completely forgot, but. Uh... It, it's um, different to like listen to Heiser, who's like this ancient Jewish source says this. And it's like, oh, cool. That's like some, you know, pseudepigraphical Babylonian, you know, excerpt that came from this group of Jewish scholars that's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> like, it's not scripture, you know, like I don't I didn't hear I don't re recall hearing Heiser being like, oh, yeah, there's a. <laughs> There, there's a there's centaur. This, there's a in centaur. Isaiah 34. Like, what, what are we talking about? Like, are you talking about a half goat guy? Like, the, uh, which is, he says, which uh, is wild. what is it? A donkey centaur in Isaiah 34. Uh, no, that's, I mean, what my, that's what my Septuagint says. It says donkey centaur. Yeah, so, so Miller, Josh is going to be too young for this, but do you remember growing up when people used to listen to Adam Sandler CDs? And he had, oh, yeah. and he had Goat Boy was one of them. <laughs> yes. yeah. I still remember the the hypnotist that was getting the guy to to get free from smoking. <laughs> and he kept yeah. farting the whole time and blaming it on the guy who was trying to get his addiction broken. This is totally unrelated. We have digressed uh, big time. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we're talking about Adam Sandler's Goat Boy today, too, I guess. So <laughs> we'll see be a really fascinating episode. I, I mean, I think Josh knows who Adam Sandler is because he's he's kind of been in the limelight for a while. But Josh was born uh, 30 minutes ago. I don't know if you guys knew that he's. He's a young buck with great hair. Can still grow a better beard than you. Okay. Oh. Hey, well, hey, hey, look, look, hold on a second. It's not his fault, dude. I mean, hey, would you put it back on, Michael? I just want to see something real quick. Is this, is this, this is, oh, this is puberty. That's what I did when I hit puberty. I, I started to, very to good. grow things. Did you do the mustache thing? Places. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Here it is. I like it. Okay. Stuff. People, we would take a 10 minutes to just dig at each other and talk about Adam Sandler. Um, let's talk. I'm going to have to put a timestamp on this video so people know when to get to the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> let's talk I'm about some it. of these mythical. Huh, say, let's talk about some of these mythical creatures, uh, specifically <laughs> these, uh, these little goat demons. We're going to start off in uh, Isaiah, man, 31 and Isaiah 34. There seems to be references. Uh, I have this Isaiah version 13. here. Yeah. Um, of the Septuagint. I encourage people to pick it up. Uh, I'm pretty sure InterVarsity published this one. Uh, the English translation. Yeah, Lexham Press, Greek sorry. Translation. <laughs> yeah, this is an English translation of the Greek translation. So um, it, it's it's by InterVarsity Press. It's great translation. I don't have these. Uh, the, the ones that we're going to be reading from have been direct pulls out of Doug Van Dorn's book. Um, it, so there are actually translations there that don't come out in my English version. So I don't know if he translated these words or if he pulled it from a more popular or online uh, version of the uh, Septuagint that I'm not aware of. Um, but anyway, uh, these, I don't know, satyrs, I, I don't know what we're going to do with these guys. Um, you guys want to read some of these verses and 
yeah, maybe try to stumble through what these guys are and what they're doing in in our Bibles. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Who do you want to go and first? These are you apocalyptic want... texts. Yeah, like Isaiah thirteen. That's apocalyptic. But uh, but yeah, I'll read. This is Isaiah. I'll, I'll just read a few of them. Okay, Isaiah thirteen twenty one. It says, "But wild beasts shall rest there, and the houses shall be filled with noises, and sirens shall rest there, and demons." Basically, the word for these satyrs, s a t y r s, shall dance there. So this is Isaiah pronouncing this apocalyptic judgment, and uh, and this section of Isaiah will be alluded to in the book of Revelation on the in the judgment on Babylon, but. Uh, you know, sirens. I remember reading Homer's like Odyssey and Iliad, and there were, uh, I guess it was the in the Odyssey where the sirens were. Uh, but I think I remember, doesn't Doug Van Dorn say that these were different kinds of sirens here, but still kind of like in that mythological yeah. realm? Yeah, yeah uh, section two uh, of the of the notes here, Roundtree has sirens and all the references, and then some of yeah. the uh, textual evidence from like Enoch, what the sirens actually are. Um, but that, I mean, that verse is just saying that there are different kinds of spirits hanging out and dancing together where our English translations typically translate those things as like unclean animals, right? Roundtree, uh, as someone who's yeah. very familiar with the apocalyptic literature, yeah. Isaiah 31, and, 21 is talking about unclean birds and things like that. Right. So our old Testament, like what English speakers, you're reading an English translation of like, say the Ma Masoretic text. And so this is what we would normally go off of. And uh, so the Septuagint and the Masoretic text are, they agree with each other on almost everything, but there are a few little uh, nuances in which they're different. And so, um, yeah, here the Septuagint says sirens and it's, it, it translated as demons, uh, but satyrs is, uh, is the actual word there. So, um, so there can be some slight differences so, between the Masoretic and the yeah. uh, Masoretic text and what we have. The ESV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the ESV, ESV just reads, but wild animals will lie down there and their house will be full of howling creatures and ostriches will dwell there uh, and there will be uh, goats. Uh, there, wild goats will dance is what it translates. So right. it, anyway, so you can see how some of the language is kind of massaged there ever so slightly and the unclean birds, owls and ostriches, they eat dead animals, so they're unclean. Uh, so it's still trying to convey the same meaning and thrust, whereas the Septuagint is really trying to emphasize, it seems, a kind of spiritual, this is a place of spiritual destruction, not just uncleanness, but like uh, spiritual defilement. Uh, Miller, uh, tag you in. I can't help but if, wonder if some of the people who worked on the ESV, I, I know that Wayne Gruden worked on it, so he clearly has a supernatural worldview. But those of us who are charismatic, we often have a supernatural worldview that only permits certain things. So the idea of a satire or a, a satyr or a siren, like that becomes kind of hard. And, and I think the thing that uh, is where Doug Van Dorn is sort of winning in the argument here is that John will quote from this passage in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. He says, uh, oh, man, I love it. Let me pull it back. I have it open right it here. Fallen, I got it. Uh, yeah. Fallen, says, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. So, um, Miller, complete your thought. I just was reading your verse. Yeah, well, I mean, the fact that he translated, or that John used the word demon in reference to what the... Uh, Septuagint would call a satyr uh, or a siren does seem to give some sort of supernatural thing. But also this is a, a judgment that's rendered on Babylon in a vision that Isaiah has. So it is apocalyptic literature. It is a judgment on Babylon. Uh, Babylon, this great city that seems to be, you know, claimed that it, it gained its power and supremacy and warfare from the gods themselves, that they were descendants from the gods. So all mm -hmm. of this sort of like, mixture of human godlike stuff is there in the mythology of Babylon. And this is the the kind of rhetoric that Isaiah is employing uh, in the Septuagint, at least, to mm -hmm. speak against it, speak about the judgment and what, what will be left there. It'll be laid desolate. And this, these are the kinds of beings right. that will be left over. 
That's right. Well, and there's kind of like, it seems like there's this both and where in the old, like when you see that owls will be there and jackals and all these desert creatures, it's like God has judged your cities and it's created an urban exodus where all these people are leaving. And when people leave cities, like think back when, remember when COVID like first struck and everyone is in their homes and you're seeing like kangaroos hopping down Australian boulevards and stuff like that. Like, the animals were just filling the cities and this was a sign of God's judgment. Well, the yeah. Septuagint actually references demons as well. So to your point, Miller, it it's, it's kind of like, well, you, your cities are filled with these desert creatures. And at the same time, there's a supernatural reality connected with that. And Miller, what I understand your point being is that since John alludes to revelation 13 in or sorry, Isaiah 13, in Revelation 18, it seems that John is uh, okay with this Septuagint He's endorsing. translation, which well, that's includes, the... endorses the presence of these demonic beings, specifically mentioned here are sirens and uh, demons or satyrs. John calls them demons, but I think, again, Miller's point is John seems to endorse that view that this judgment is unveiling sort of not just a natural <laughs> intrusion into cities, uh, but this sort of wicked supernatural intrusion that just as demons seem to inhabit wildernesses. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Like the, the city becomes a wilderness, a haunt for every unclean spirit. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that's a strong point. Josh, I haven't heard from you in a while. Uh, Miller, did you have something that you wanted to say, bud? I, I thought I heard you say, like, kind of pipe up just there. Well, it's just the nature of apocalyptic literature, right? It's it's always in these kind of visionary experiences, what you see in the Revelation of Christ by John, you see the backdrop. Like, you think this is the way things are, but when the the curtain gets pulled and you look behind what the veil of what separates the natural and supernatural, you find not just these owls, but Lilith, not just these jackals or hyenas, these desert creatures, this wasteland creature that shows up to scavenge, you see demons and satyrs and sirens. And I think that's what the, that may be. It's not necessarily a one or the other. John could be quite literally employing both um, by use of apocalyptic literature. Yeah. The, when I look at these passages, so we, we read Isaiah 31 or 13, 21, but now we're going to read Isaiah like 34, 14 and devils yeah, shall meet yeah. with the satyrs and shall cry one to another uh they shall uh there shall the lilith rest having found for herself a place of rest we'll go into lilith here in a second as well but when we talk about this these satyrs if i, if I went over to the esv that same verse uh and wild animals shall meet with hyenas and a wild goat shall cry to his fellow i don't really know what that's supposed to mean indeed uh there the night bird settles and finds for herself a resting place. Um, so again, you can still see that both passages are emphasizing judgment. So it's not like there's a huge departure uh, from the Masoretic, from the Septuagint, uh, but the, the kind of overt supernatural context there does seem to be a little jaded. Now, if I were to take a reading of Isaiah and try to read it back into some former verses in scripture, or maybe I should say it the other way around, maybe I could look at Leviticus and Chronicles and have those be a context of reading into Isaiah 34, uh, Leviticus 17, 7. Uh, so they shall uh, no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. Uh, they shall be my, uh, this shall be my statute forever for them throughout all their generations. In Second Chronicles 11, 15, and he appointed his own priest for, a, uh, for the high places and for the goat idols uh, and for the calves that he made. So in Second Chronicles 11, 15, there's a, a record of uh, Israel going uh, wayward and offering up idols, uh, offering up sacrifices to goat idols. And Leviticus 17, 7 uh, verse, uh, uh, d d describes how these are false gods. These are demon gods that they're offering up sacrifices to, but they're goat demons. Uh, it reminds me of the the picture of the, I don't know, what was the, was it in Chicago? It was, it was in some major city recently. They, they put like a Baphomet statue. That's like, it's got the, the head of a goat, the legs of a goat, but like the body of a human, like the torso and the arms of a human. Um, mm -hmm. It's just interesting to me that again, this is a kind of re-emerging picture that comes back up in modern 
satanic worship, um, but we see in Isaiah and in Second Chronicles, there was some kind of worship to a deity that looked like this. And as the scriptures seem to talk about idol and idolos, uh, idolatrous worship, that we're not offering up sacrifices to gods, but we're actually offering up sacrifices to demons. So it's very possible that when we're reading Isaiah, what he's just saying is like, hey, there is a spirit behind that idol, right? Uh, is a real demonic force that's receiving worship, that's leading people astray, that's behind that idol. It's not just stone, it's not just wood, but there's something else supernatural that's going on. And it seems as if they're really attributing a kind of sentience, if you will, uh, an actual um, living demonic force behind that idol. When we when we look at the totality of those scriptures and all of those different verses. Um, anyway, those are some thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah. I I mean, I think it's certain that that's throughout the scripture. I mean, Deuteronomy 32 and 1 Corinthians 10, I think it's 32, 17 and 1 Corinthians 10, 20, both refer to the false gods of the nations as demons. So you have both Old and New Testament texts saying that literal thing. And, and Paul will engage that discussion too in 1 Corinthians where he'll say like, I, you know, we know an idol is nothing. And yet at the same time, he, is, he ascribes the, like what is worshipped behind this idol is being a demon. And so there's a sense in which the idols are nothing because they're just wood and they're stone, but there is a demonic force that is really ultimately being worshipped in that. But, but I would say we even as we talk about these strange creatures, whether sarters or sirens or chimeras uh, or any of the other things we might have read about in high school English only to learn about that they're also uh, in our Bibles in this weird way, is I think we have to, and you kind of touched on this at the top of the episode, uh, but we're going to need to discuss, okay, to what degree is this like a, a sort of demon idol type of connection? Uh, but Or could it be that like, the biblical authors are co-opting the myths of their times to sort of score political points on them. Is this polemic against them? Is basically like Bible trash talk against the false gods kind of deal? Could that be what's happening? Some people say these are offspring of the Elohim, sort of like the demigods in Greek mythology. Other people say that these are sort of like genetically altered animals uh, that... <laughs> that survived the flood sort of, or at least their genetics did. And, and they continue to be talked about, like, these are some of the theories as to what these things are. So I don't know how you guys want to walk through some of that. I know by the end of our episode, we're going to, we're going to be answering all of these questions, Lord willing. I think some of them are easier we'll than have others. An answer to be clear. I, it, we will we'll suggest theories, but I don't know if we'll have an answer. Yeah. I think this one for me, like if I was going to talk about the, 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 the satyrs, right. That one seems easier for me. That one seems to be like there's a spirit. Nowhere in the references that I have uh, in Isaiah and Leviticus and Second Chronicles do any of those seem to be uh, a human angel or even an angel animal. animal hybrid or a genetically altered or, you know, like it certainly could be polemical. But if I look at Leviticus 17.7 and Second Chronicles 11.15 and then I take that in connection with what Paul says, um, and what Moses says about offering up to idols, I can say within, with when some level of certainty, I think that that's a demon. Like that is a, it's a spiritual force that seems to exist. Um, that's leading people away, uh, from Yahweh. Um, that seems clear, uh, to me. Well, and you would be happy to weigh in if you'd like. I've kind of already, I probably showed my hand on that. Jesus. You've mm -hmm. got Jesus casting demons out of people that are, you know, running around, like cutting themselves, uh, and, you know, enchained and living in graveyards. I mean, it does seem like demons like these kinds of desolate places. And then you've got Leviticus 16 that talks about the sacrifice that's made to Azazel or the scapegoat, the goat demon, right? They, they, they take one goat, they sacrifice it, take the other goat, and they make sure that it reaches the boundary of Israel and they send it away to the desert place or the unclean place to the unclean god Azazel. And so you've got all of that kind of painting the backdrop of these desolate places. It makes sense that it would be, yes, that these animals that come here, they happen to be unclean animals, but they also sort of represent the spirits that are also unclean that reside in these kinds of places where there's desolation and death and unclean things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it can be a blend where on one hand we can say the inspired author is referring to something demonic here. Uh, even though there's sort of like this idolatry that can be associated with them, but there's something demonic behind it. I think we can affirm that on one hand. And I think we can also say that uh, th 
that they are trying to score political points over their opponents because you know, like Josh, you preached over the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Yep. And I know you walked through with your church. Maybe you can help us out on that a little bit. Some of the polemics against like in Genesis chapter one, the creation story, it's like, we read it and like, ah, oh, it's cute. Day one, this happened. Oh, it's beautiful. Day two, that happened. Praise God. It's awesome. It is beautiful. However, there is more than meets the eye. If you were to try to read it through the ancient Near Eastern lens, there's a polemic toward false gods. And so we see that theme going on throughout. I could definitely see it here happening at the same time that we're affirming there's some real demonic activity. But Josh, I, I don't know if you want to go into that sure. at all. Not too yeah, much, I but. can. I can try to do it quickly. Uh, I would just say Genesis 1 through 11 is, is a reliable historical account told in a polemical way. So the way that I tell it, the story is, imagine me and my brother-in-law are at a Thanksgiving uh, family gathering and we're playing football before dinner. He, you know, trips and doesn't make the the winning pass, right? And then we, you know, we, uh, you know, trips doesn't make, he doesn't, the, the, the winning uh, reception, I suppose. Um, uh, we, we have dinner and then I'm telling the story about how we had dinner later at, to the rest of the family. And I'm saying, yeah, we all ate. We had a really good time. I... I passed out all the ham and I didn't trip. And then I, you know, spooned out the gravy and the mashed potatoes and, and I didn't trip and I made sure to score and, and see, I'm telling the story in a way that kind of gives jabs at my brother-in-law, which I would never do, by the way, that's not within my character. Um, but uh, just as a way of an example, um, as a way of an example, it's a historical <laughs> telling of a real event that actually happened, but told in a poly pol polemical way in order to shame uh, a specific audience, right? So. I can say that Genesis 1 through 11 is actually a historic account, but it's told in a way um, that's very polemical against Babylonian and ancient gods. Now, you'd say, well, Babylon came way later. I think the Babylonian gods are based off of all the Mesopotamian gods, uh, which would have existed around the time that this was all written. So you don't really have to, you know, exaggerate, oh, this is Babylon or Egypt or Mesopotamia. All the gods have similar origin stories for the most part. Um, so there's a mythological god, you know, Tiamount, who is this great sea creature. Well, in the Genesis account, he creates the tanin, and that seems to have a similar root word for this sea creature, right? This the, the tanin within uh, uh, Tiamat, right, uh, that we see in the kind of Mesopotamian literature. But also, when God creates in the kind of mythological story, uh, you have God basically dying or, or trying uh, to create and is mortally wounded, trying to separate the waters from the water and the land from the water and those kinds of things. Whereas the, the God Yahweh speaks to it and it forms and it, it obeys his command and his voice. He doesn't war. He doesn't uh, have to fight other gods. He, he doesn't become mortally damaged from doing this. So it's telling a true story. But if you know the subtext, it's telling a true story in a polemical way to jab at other gods. So right. is it possible that this is actually telling the ancient Jewish authors or the ancient Jewish people, hey, this is a real demonic entity, but also telling the story in a certain way that this is a sign of judgment, kind of co-opting some of that language. And I think that's, yeah. I think that, that to, to Michael's point, it can certainly be a a combination of those things i think yeah um hey well, i won't tell the whole story because i know we got a lot of notes to go to I go know. through but i will just say this like real succinctly there was a time where i was casting a demon uh out of a guy who was like um this guy he was a country bumpkin he definitely had no knowledge of leviticus 16 or ancient hebrew or anything like that it reached a point where I don't usually, or I don't always do this, but I did this. Um, I, I asked the demon's name, Jesus models that. Uh, I asked the demon's name and he looked at me and there are all kinds of manifestations going on. Uh, and he said, Azazel. And I actually didn't know the term at that time. I had read Leviticus 16, but in a lot of translations, it's just translated as the scapegoat. And, uh, and so I hadn't noticed uh, that original Hebrew word. And so, uh, anyway, I just say that because I, I think this is a real demon, Azazel, uh, not just because of that experience, but, you know, lots of other reasons, too. But I'm just saying it's quite interesting that this country bumpkin would have said this ancient Hebrew word that very few people on the planet actually know. Um, I thought it was fascinating. Anyway, so just wait for clarification. You would say uh, the scriptures seem to indicate that this is real. And my personal experience affirms what I see in scripture, not I saw this in my personal experience and then found it in the Bible, right? Just to be clear for, for yeah, the heretic hunters perfect. who want to come after Michael Roundtree yeah. because they're jealous of that really magical mustache. <laughs> there it is. Um, <laughs> More polemics. 
<laughs> More <laughs> polemics. There it is. It's a polemical story of a historical event. Um, let's talk about sirens. When do you guys want to pick up on the sirens? I'll let Miller tag in. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. So sirens are often depicted as creatures uh, luring sailors into their deaths with their enchanting voices. They sort of, you know, uh, sing and hypnotize the sailors to come towards them or they have an attractive appearance that draws them in. So we see that in a lot of like, you know, Homer's writings, uh, various Greek poets. Um, so sometimes they're used to represent creatures associated with desolation and mourning. And we see this in Isaiah 13, 21. The word sirens is translated from a word that uh, refers to creatures that dwell in desolate places, sometimes depicted as wild or mythological beings. And so we've already referenced this in the Septuagint. In verse 21 of Isaiah 13, it says, But wild beasts shall rest there, and the houses shall be filled with noises, and sirens shall rest there, and demons shall dance there. And then you see it again in Isaiah 34, verse 13 through 14. It says, And thorns shall spring up in their cities, and in, their, in her strongholds uh, they shall be habitations of sirens and a court for ostriches, and devils shall meet with satyrs, and one shall cry to the other. There shall, be, there shall sirens rest, having found for themselves a, um, a place of rest. And then you've also got some Second Temple literature that refers to this as well. And First Enoch 19.2 says, And the women also of the angels who went astray shall become sirens. And I, Enoch, alone saw the vision. So this is an interesting thing because Enoch is claiming in, in this that the women who procreated with the uh, B'nai Elohim, the angels that came down, these women became the sirens. That's it. It's, it's kind of like Lord of the Rings when, you know, the the kings put on the rings of power. Uh, they become wraiths because they lose themselves to that yes. power. Uh, that's kind of what Enoch is saying here, that these these women were human women, but because they had somehow co-opted power that was unnatural, their souls are like eternally damned to become the sirens who would lure men away because right. immorality lured them away. Let's I mean, let's use biblical examples of this as well. I mean, we see that that Satan himself, uh, you know, if if Origen is correct, and I think it's Clement as well who connects the Satan figure with uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel, um, you see this, you know, being of light, this chosen one who was meant to sort of represent, uh, you know, kind of a high level angel um, become thrust to the earth. And so he takes on a deformed nature. And now he's like, you know, uh, equated with like a, ser a serpent in Genesis, mm -hmm. something that's sort of slippery and the lowest of all creatures, a deformed thing that's slippery and less than what it was ever intended to be. And so there's some biblical precedent for something I would say becoming uh, twisted and morphed into its own desires. And, and you see this with people as well, right? They, God hands them over to their desires. That's sort of a form of judgment. Um, and, you know, that's why we say stuff like we can't, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And you also see that as people get older, uh, just in the flesh, their faces take on the contours of their expressions that are given over years. So a person who's filled with joy will also have uh, what crow's feet on their eyes. And a person who's given over to bitterness and anger and wrath, they've got a constant scowl. Uh, we have a derogatory term to reference this. <laughs> Resting yeah. in something face. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. And and then yeah, for yeah. those who those who you know uh, practice the dark arts, they have really bad mustaches right here. So okay, uh, I would say uh, on the sirens, if I had to make a vote, like. Arts. Hold me, hold me to it. Uh, came to like a vote on the the demon, the goat demon. I go, hey, that one seems real. This one, I really can't tell. I I am not going to let Enoch and the stories of angels having relationships with women and those women being kind of like eternally damned to be sirens. Like I'm not going to let that paint my interpretation. And oh. without any other external reference within the scripture itself. So it's one thing if hey, some Jewish scholars thought this. It's another thing if the scriptures themselves are kind of articulating and clarifying what this is. Uh, I don't know if this could be, you know, some wild bird or owl. This could be um, a spirit. Uh, this could be a polemical writing. It could be, but I am not compelled on this text alone. Uh, you'll see the Isaiah 34. I think we quoted it earlier. Uh, here it translates siren, but another uh, English translation, I think it translates that Lilith, um, where the habitation of Lilith uh, and... Uh, a court for ostriches, right? That kind of thing. I think I think that's the, mm -hmm. the translation in, in different ways. Yeah. So I just, we'll I look at that and I go, maybe that seems a little stretchy. That doesn't seem to be as concrete as the others. 
Um, but that's my thoughts. Do you guys... would, it, would you would you say against it as well, or are you just saying I don't know? No, I mean I would say I have some confidence that there is a demon goat that exists. What that means, I don't know, but it seems as if the scriptures are clear. Isaiah <laughs> talking about a siren. Soundbite that like I, I hope someone sign about it right. There's a demon goat somewhere. There's a demon goat somewhere. <laughs> I just I, but like this siren thing, I'm I'm not sure that that's exactly what this is. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. So help me out here because um. I don't. I know that that it's it's very easy to let anecdotal experience cloud your interpretation or filter into your interpretation of scripture. Um, with a passage like this, I'm like, I don't know. But I have experienced some really weird things when casting out demons. Like these demons are not all the same between that are in different people. Like when I've cast demons out of people who have done yoga, I've seen demons or people literally slither on the ground. Uh, I've seen people begin to loud, like when I've cast out of uh, demons that have attacked people in shame and condemnation, and it seemed to attack them at the night, keeping them awake, they have these long moans as these things come out, like almost like a, I don't know, like a night owl. Um, and so there's that part of me that's like, I know that I can't read into the text these experiences, but I don't know what to do with these experiences and why they're so varied. It seems like the demons that are coming out of people are that varied. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that there are lots of different creatures and lots of uh, creatures as in critters, demons, um, and they probably manifest in all sorts of different ways, and I'm okay with that. Um, what I don't want to do is categorize them based off of an obscure verse I don't really understand. So, like, yeah, what I don't I, want to take a definitive stance. That's for right, sure. Right, 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 right. So, and I wouldn't even try to compound any teaching. If if someone releases a book on how to cast out goat demon spirits, uh, how to cast out a centaur, you know, thirty two chapters on <laughs> how to have your freedom a now. Centaur. I'd be like, dude, a donkey wrote that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't read that. That's stupid. <laughs> um, it doesn't tell it like we. How do we handle demons? You tell them to go in Jesus' name, right? Like we we don't need to create a huge manual based off of an obscure verse. Um, so I would not disagree that there are probably different, you know, categories of demonic activity. Um, I would be careful trying to create a theological understructure for, um, I don't know, the, the vast category of demons there are. Demon, you do this. Or when you deal yeah, yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. You do this. Or when you deal I, I guess with it's more Hunter of and siren. <laughs> I think that the scriptures are more just saying, hey, this is a thing. There's an actual spirit behind that. So like when you're going into areas and they're, they're worshiping a Baphomet statue, like there's a real thing there. That's how I take yeah. that. I, like that's you know, what I it's, learned it's from that message. Interesting on that note to think about how when Beelzebub is mentioned in the New Testament, that's Lord of the Flies. But this was basically like in its OG status, the God of the Philistines in uh, like one of their five cities. I think it was Ekron. Um, <clears throat> and so that ended up becoming used ultimately to speak of Satan. And so I don't know what to make of that, but uh, but it's interesting that they're using like the false God label to talk about a spirit being cast out. Same idea with the spirit of divin divination and act 16 being the spirit of Python, which we've talked about being associated with the oracles of Delphi and their culture. And so it again comes back to these false gods uh, having real demonic powers behind them. And to Miller's point about these wide varieties, like there are wide varieties of lowercase g gods that people are worshiping. I mean, Hindus have 300 and gosh, I hear between 36 million and 360 million uh, false gods. And of course, all the world religions. And so we should expect lots of different manifestations. And you ask its name, it's probably going to tell you, tell you something in this person and a different name in that person. And, uh, and so I, I, I can see all this, but I guess maybe the question I would have is like, I, it's interesting to dive into these kind of details, but I also wouldn't want to teach or instruct anyone to become like really obsessive about oh I gotta that's right you know, I'm gonna skip my time with yeah. Jesus today so I can study more about sirens you know and those kind of things like <laughs> um, no your priority is just like read your Bible and obey it that's the priority uh, mm -hmm. meet with the God who wrote the Bible and it can be fun for us to kind of debate these kind of things and talk about it because as students of the Word we care about every word in the Word it all matters. We don't want to become obsessive about theories, I think is where I'm going with that. That's right. That's right. And, you, you know, definitively prove. 
I like that Miller mentioned that like, hey, Kundalini, I, well, he didn't say this, but you know, yoga, they slather on the floor. Well, part of the attribute of the yoga is that Kundalini spirit is, is you're trying to release a a spirit at the you know base of your spine that's a serpent that kind of like releases this energy throughout your body. So it makes sense that um, this spirit has revealed itself in this way to the people who are practicing this form of worship, um, and that, that 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 might cause some kind of uniformity. So like M- Michael mentioned, the the Hindu gods that there's like you know 236 million or what, from what I understand, there's like 150 million of those false gods that have mustaches right here on their face. <laughs> Um, oh and that might cause a certain a kind of manifestation. <laughs> I am. It's just too easy. Okay. How many of them, Josh, how many of them have <laughs> premature gray hair? <laughs> none. None. That's none. only Moses and me. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> and Charleston Heston. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about dragons, uh, Roundtree, since I took a jab at you. I'll let you, I'll let you take a stab at dragons. That... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, dragons, and we'll also look at this word tenine. Did I say it right, Josh? Um, the, Sounds good to me. Uh, yeah, the Septuagint uses these terms uh, to describe these powerful creatures that are really terrifying. And uh, and the word uh, tenine can be translated as dragon, snake, or sea monster. So here's a handful. Here are a handful of verses, uh, beginning with the first chapter of the Bible. And Josh mentioned this earlier when he was uh, kind of talking us through Genesis 1 and following, but it says, And God created the great sea monsters, Tanin, and every living creature uh, that moves, with which the waters swarmed according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. Moving forward, Exodus 7, 9. And Pharaoh shall speak to you, saying, Give us a sign and a wonder. Then you shall say to Aaron, your brother, Take your rod and cast it on the ground before the Lord, and it shall become a Tanin, a serpent. Uh, Psalm 73, 13, you divided the sea by your might. You broke the head of the dragons, uh, on the waters. Okay. And then, uh, in that day, the Lord will punish with his great fierce and mighty sword, Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent. He will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Uh, and that is alluded to in revelation 12 and revelation 20. Uh, Amos 9, 3, though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. Uh, I think it's interesting that in associated with creation, as well as in association with the Exodus story, both of which have waters as a, uh, as a very prominent theme and God conquering the waters of chaos and evil. And within that context, you have these sea monsters these dragon-like serpentine creatures that live in the sea. Are they real? Are they just symbols of demons? Is it polemical? Uh, I think where we're all kind of seeming to land is that it is real in the sense that it was a demonic entity. uh, And at the same time, it seems to have been polemical against some of the false gods of the nations. But ultimately, it's Yahweh who easily conquers the waters of chaos and evil uh, represented in Genesis 1 in creation, as well as in the Exodus story retold in Psalm 73 in the new creation redemption as Israel comes through the waters. And of course, Mm. we even have a replication of that in baptism. If you go back and read 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, that we're uh, saved through baptism and Man, that's a whole can of worms we could unpack, but we're not going to have time today. But it's once again, it's being saved through the waters as God uh, conquers the forces of evil on our behalf and redeems his people. So uh, you guys have anything to add to anything that I said on those verses? I just want to say stuff about Carmen Iim's commentary on uh, Exodus. Uh, Me and Miller, I think, Rancher, I'm not sure if you were there, but I know me and Miller were there and Dawson was there. The best lecture ever. Uh, It's two years ago at ETS. And uh, she was talking about her commentary in Exodus that she was working on. And she talked about how not all the plagues are actually called plagues in scripture, but we have titled them all the plagues, right? And she says there's two bookends to the signs. She calls them the signs of Moses, the signs of God through Moses, whatever. And uh, she says the first one was when Moses throws the serpent on the ground and the serpent swallows up the other serpent. The last sign is when Pharaoh likely in the battle dress of the Egyptian kings, is wearing a serpent headdress and goes into the the, the waters, right? Into uh, the river to chase after Moses. And then the water swallows up the other serpent. And the, and the image of water coming down in on the... 
it looks like a, a serpent headdress. A serpent it looks like a swallowing serpent, a serpent swallowing a serpent. Um, anyway, I just thought it was cool uh, because you mentioned both the symbolic kind of reading of that, but then also how it speaks of. Well, here in Genesis, this is what I really like about Genesis, is that he says he created the Tanin. So in the understanding of the ancient Near Eastern people, which means that these spirits were designed and created by God. So God didn't have to war with the Tanin. He didn't like almost die trying to fight the Tanin. These are beings that he created. And I'm inclined to lean into that and say that, you know, these kind of spiritual creatures that exist at one time were likely created to worship God rightly and that they're following spiritual beings. How that works I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. Um, but I'm inclined to think that that is a picture of God's creation, destruction, and then authority over all of the chaos. Uh, and that one day he'll destroy the Leviathan, the Tanin, uh, these kind of spiritual beings. Uh, and I think I think the scriptures are pretty clear to that. Uh, yeah, Miller, do you have anything other, to add? Yeah, you've got some other references. You've got uh, Job 41, where Job is basically being asked a series of rhetorical questions by God. Um, showing him his ignorance at the kinds of dumb things that Job would say about God and about his own plight. But he, you see this happen. He says, can you pull in the Leviathan with a hook and tie down its tongue with a rope? I mean, you're seeing like God goes fishing for Leviathans. It's just sort of showing you like this sea creature that causes chaos mm -hmm. out in the open ocean, God just pulls in with a fishing line. And then you've mm -hmm. also got Jesus displaying the same kind of power over Leviathan when he calms the storm. Like that's not yeah. just some uh, image of Jesus' miracle working power. It's him showing you uh, his sovereignty over the cosmic forces of the earth, one of them being the Leviathan, the sea monster, or the sea itself. Right. Yeah, point well, six in the notes has got like six references to Leviathan. That's right. Well, and then, you know, you mentioned Job, uh, Miller, and Job is one of those like, most of these other ones, I don't think there's like huge debate of like, are these genetically altered animals or something like that? But when you get to Job, that's where the debate really starts to rage because uh, there are those who take a, an entirely naturalistic uh, interpretation of these verses where the Lord is describing this creature that some are like, well, it sounds like he's describing a hippo, like it moves and it's, you know, no one can stop it and it's hanging out in the marshlands or whatever. And, uh, and so it describes this gargantuan creature and others are like, hey, it's talking about the dinosaurs and there's dinosaurs in the Bible. And then uh, other, other people, are, <laughs> oh, bro. Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember who, man, our, our episode on spiritual warfare in Job and, I, and uh, his name was Bob. I, I lost his last name, but uh, I'll find it. A Dallas Theological Seminary guy. Fantastic episode. You should go back and watch. And he he seems to take kind of a blended view that it's talking about animals, but that it's also speaking beyond the animals in much the same way that a lot of people understand the verses and say Ezekiel is like not just talking about the king of Tyre, but talking about the devil also, like a speaking beyond, which the Bible does often do, uh, he wouldn't ascribe to the genetically altered animals view. It would just be like, yeah, it seems like Job is describing an animal, but then also more than an animal. So Dr. He's Bob Chisholm, got to be, he's got to be doing more than just an animal there because otherwise it takes away the whole point of what God is asking Job. Right. Like God it's can conquer be cosmic hippos, on some level. can't. Like, I don't yeah, know, yeah. I think people can conquer hippos. Like, I, yeah. I don't see hippos just like ruling over humans. I mean, I wouldn't want to be in like the uh, octagon with one, you know, it would probably be <laughs> <For> sure. <in laughs> context, but give me a gun and I'll, you know, I'm going to win, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> just like Joe would have had a Glock, <laughs> a Glock 19, <laughs> um, uh, the, the scholar I, I you're referencing. More than a Glock 19 for sure. For sure. But, uh, yeah. Bob Chisholm was the guy that you're looking for. Bob if you Chisholm, type in spiritual warfare in the book of Job in and YouTube, you'll find it. We started talking. We ended, cool. up, we ended up giving him an Uber ride home and we're like, come on our show. He's like, great. Anyway, good episode came out of it. So uh, anyway, guys, we haven't talked about Lilith yet. We got to talk about Lilith. Is she next, I think? Yeah, get to some Lilith. Unless home. you want to skip down to Leviathan. Uh, not that we would wouldn't go back to Lilith. Uh, yeah, we but, can do Leviathan and then come back. Because we're kind of already talking about it with the, with the sea dragons. Leviathan seems sure. to have a specific name. So it is a sea dragon, um, as we mentioned in Job. 
uh, Job 3.8, Job 41. I don't have all the references in there, but uh, it basically seems to suggest like who can pull down the Leviathan with a hook? Like it's not physically possible. And again, there's no creature that we know of that's like this. Um, anyway, he, he describes it in great detail. He talks about how its, its scales are impenetrable, um, you know, breathes fire. I mean, there's just this wild illustration. We have a whole video on Leviathan that I would encourage people to go check out where we kind of uh, initially came to the video going, ah, this is a creature. This is for sure a sea creature. And then when we started hunting down all the references, like in Psalm 74 and Psalm 104 and Isaiah 27, we were like, oh no, this is for sure a spirit. Like we totally changed our it's, position. It's, just it's studying Nessie. Right. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's, we it's did, Nessie. We did though oppose the common charismatic practice of like, that person is a narcissist, so they're affected by a Leviathan spirit. That's right. Really That's silly. That. I, I don't know. I mean, Miller probably buys it. <laughs> Go there now. <laughs> Miller's like, Miller, wait, we got a Miller, name for narcissism how many and demons? spirits have you cast out, bro? How many? Uh, not one. Not that I know of. Uh, th- th- that's the one you can't get rid of. Like, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a fishing line that big. It, it, oh, does man. it have premature gray hair? Oh, my. Yes. Here he goes. Okay, let's. <laughs> Let's get back into uh, Lilith or Roundtree. I mean, I just I read a couple of references. I'll encourage people to go check our lar- larger podcast because we've tackled that one in great detail. Here, you 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 take over with 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 Lilith, Lady Lilith and and those who are seduced with mustaches. <laughs> okay, so the the <laughs> seduced with no. Okay, so <laughs> the uh, night demon or nocturnal creature Lilith. Here are the references. Isaiah thirty four fourteen. Man, that that's a uh, rich with supernatural references. And devils shall Josh's favorite word devils. And devils shall meet with satyrs, and they shall cry one to the other, and there shall the Lilith rest having found for herself a place of rest. So this uh, night demon mythological creature uh, known in ancient times is mentioned in this Bible verse in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, So this is from the Targum Pseudo-Jonathan. It says, uh, May the Lord bless you in all your deeds and protect you from the Lilith, interpreted as demons of the night. We can talk about that. So Dead Sea Scrolls, Songs of the Sage, It says, and I know you guys are probably thinking like these aren't like from the Bible, which actually is a great objection because that's kind of where we're at too. But these are still worth bringing up because it does help us enter into the uh, thinking of these ancient Jewish, uh, uh, ancient Jewish people about Lilith. It says, and I, the sage, declare the splendor of his radiance in order to frighten and terrify all the spirits of the ravaging angels, the bastard spirits. That's weird to say. Demons, Lilith, Howlers, and those who strike unexpectedly and the spirits of the malevolent host. Last, Rabbi Hanina said it is prohibited to sleep alone in a house, and anyone who sleeps alone in a house will be seized by the evil spirit Lilith. Uh, Okay, and again, we just want you to know, we don't view those as inspired verses. Some of you live alone. The Apostle Paul probably lived alone. (laughs) Like, don't think that you're going to be... um, haunted by Lilith unless you get a roommate. That's silly talk. But these yeah. are some things that people were writing around the time. Do you guys have any thoughts on this Lilith? Uh, well, I just have I have some thoughts on those references. I know Miller's probably got a story. Uh, the the pseudo Jonathan, that is a Targum. Uh, if you don't know what Targum is, think Passion Translation. It's when someone takes a Bible and then they add their interpretation of what the scriptures are saying into the Bible, no one would have re- reviewed it or revered it as inspired word of God scripture. They would just say, oh, that's what this guy thinks about the scripture. So instead of like today, we have a Bible verse and a commentary below it in our in our study Bibles. Uh, this is written in a different way where it's like all inclusive into one text. So they go, okay, this is this person's interpretation. And and that is a ironic blessing. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord make, make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Within that that Targum, within that interpretation, the blessing and to shine his face, he says within that there's an interpretation that says that'll protect you from the spirit Lilith. And it seems as if, uh, according to the Babylonian Talmud, uh, you, you read Rabbi Hen- Henina. Uh, anyway, that's a Babylonian Talmud, Shabbat uh, 151b. You can go read that for yourself if you wanted to. Uh, but all of those seem to suggest that Lilith is some kind of like seductress like spirit. So like leaving, living alone, you'll be kind of allured with sexual immorality in your sleep, in your dreams, those kinds of things. Uh, that Lilith is a spirit of lust, uh, immorality, that kind of thing. 
Um, well, it, Miller, got any thoughts? I mean, I have no problem with the idea that that could be real. And if Isaiah is pulling from, you know, surrounding beliefs uh, where they would have seen Lilith as a good uh, goddess that they invite, um, Isaiah sees it as a demon. Um, but what is interesting to me is the number of things that we have currently uh, in life today where old demons are being named for certain events. Like we've already mentioned uh, the Baphomet statue being erected. We have uh, a, what do you call it? A clothing, um, I don't know what you call those things, where you display all the new design dresses and fashion uh, called Lilith Fair. Um, and so you're seeing some semblance of these names being employed for various enterprises today. Um, and and I once got to wonder, like, why is that? Why is it these names just keep hanging around? Uh, why haven't they disappeared in antiquity? Why is it cropping up today in our own culture, uh, which is largely worldly and seduction is all around us? Um, so it wouldn't surprise me, naturalistically speaking, if there's uh, some other explanation for this as well. Like it does make sense when people are alone that they have certain temptations to do things they wouldn't do otherwise. Um, so, it, you know, you see even God saying that it's not good for man to be alone uh, early on. Um, that should be a lesson for all of us today. Um, so I don't know. I'm just, I've got a lot of thoughts yeah. mulling in my head right now. I haven't sure. had any particular encounter with Lilith and casting out a demon. I have had demons that have come in through sexual morality that we've had to cast out of people um, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Not Lilith in particular, but maybe one day. Yeah. For for the sake of time restraints, we should probably uh, do some closing thoughts real quick. So uh, round trail, toss it over to you. Miller, if you have some quick thoughts, we'll try to give him one or two minutes so that we uh, stick to time. Uh, yeah. Round starting with you. Sure. So, I mean, we talked through all these different mythical th creatures, the satyrs, and, uh, you know, we could have gone into more detail about centaurs and uh, centaurs and like a specific type of centaur that's a mix of donkey and man and, uh, you know, Lilith and some of these others. And uh, I think where this just keeps coming back to for us is we do think there is legitimacy to this uh, Septuagint translation on these texts because John seems to allude to it in Revelation 18.2 when he says, Fallen is Babylon the Great, haunt of, jackal, uh, haunt of Jackals and Haunt of Demons. And so he seems to be actually alluding to the Septuagint text, affirming that as, uh, as a real thing. And what we would say is, hey, this isn't like genetically mutated pre-flood animals that somehow survived. This is, this is not some sort of like derivative of the, the Nephilim uh, or anything like that. We would just say that these are the false gods of the nations and, uh, and that these false gods of the nations, uh, that the biblical authors are simultaneously talking a little bit of smack about these false gods being associated with God's judgment and on the receiving end of that. And so uh, I think that's probably about how we would all interpret this. And again, we don't want to we don't want anyone to become obsessive with these kind of creatures where you care more about reading the Bible to learn about these than you do about getting to know God. I think that would be my biggest thing. Uh, at the same time, let's care about every word in the Bible. Let's explore every nook and cranny because that's part of what it means to just love God's word. And so that's why we're doing the things that we're doing. Miller, do you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, I would say that the, I, I'm with you guys on this. I have no idea. Uh, I, I'm not going to lean towards there being these sort of half breed uh, animal angel hybrids. Um, I do believe the story about the sons of God and that half breed thing, but I'm not really sure what to do with any of it. Um, I do think there is one application that's worth looking into, especially in a day where we can alter people's genetic makeup. We, we are able to sort of clone uh, animals. Um, was one of my young life kids. His dad was one of the ones who did that at Texas A&M with a sheep. Um, and you're, there is, you know, potential for the mixture of animals. And what we see in the scriptures is that the mixing of these things is to be handled with some sense of condemnation and shame. And so I'm very curious and I'm very, uh, concerned about the flippancy with which we may enter into these kind of sciences as a practical application. I think there should be a, a holy fear and trembling when it comes to engaging in that kind of uh, experimentation. 
Yeah, I think these are both good thoughts. Uh, for those of you who are watching, you're like, hey, I feel like you guys had a bunch of show notes that y'all didn't get into. Well, you're right. And if you didn't get the show notes, we'd encourage you to jump over on Patreon. We're going to publish them over there. So uh, we did we covered most of what we, we had, but that'll give you some of the source material and then kind of the references to, and how does people believe these are genetically altered, you know, animals? Well, we've got some people's kind of fringe theories all kind of described there in paragraph form. So uh, it's like a five-page doc. Feel free to jump over there and download it if you're interested. Uh, for the rest of you, man, jump on the newsletter because there's lots of content that we're coming out here with Remnant Radio, Introduction to Christian Theology. That course was just released. Man, we've got stuff on conferences, uh, courses, Patreon content, so much to follow at Remnant Radio. The best way to be notified about all that stuff, including speaking schedules, is going to be over there on the newsletter. So go down to the link in the description. And if you're in Wisconsin or Tuscaloosa, uh, come out and hang out with us this week. Blessings. See you next time.